for those that signed on early could see and hear all of the excitement going on. We are truly uh, excited and happy to be here. On behalf of the ADC Board of Directors and staff, it is my extreme pleasure to be able to welcome everyone this evening. And thank you for connecting with our community for this very special Black History program. We all know that the great history of African-American extends way beyond the boundaries of one month. Not only this month, but every month, we must recognize and celebrate the history of the accomplishments of African-Americans. Tonight, we are honored to thank, recognize, and celebrate our speaker for this evening, Dr. Deborah Gray White. Her accomplishments, which you'll hear shortly, to research, record, write, create, educate, and much more about the history of African American is nothing short of absolutely astounding. Dr. Deborah Gray White, tonight we salute you as we are celebrating our Black History Month. And thank you for sharing this space with us this evening. I'd also like to thank um, our band leadership team, Tony, Bertha, Cecile, and our staff liaison, Lori Delaney, for your efforts to bring this impactful program to our alumni and friends. So I know we're all excited, so get comfortable, get ready, because we're about to hear a message that we need to hear at this time in our nation. So Dr. Deborah Gray Wright, thank you again for spending your evening with us and sharing uh, what is going to be an impactful, inspiring, educational, informative, and so much more talk with us this evening. Thank you again for being with us. Bertha, you're on mute too. <laughs> We're all muted. Okay. Thank you, Valerie. Dr. Deborah Gray White, we are honored to have you here and thank you for generously sharing your knowledge and expertise. Dr. Deborah Gray White is Board of Governors Distinguished Professor of History at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, New Jersey, and a Distinguished Fellow at the Rutgers Institute for Global Racial Justice. She is author of Aren't I a Woman? Female Slaves in the Plantation South. Too Heavy a Load, Black Women in Defense of Themselves, 1894 to 1994. Several K through 12 textbooks on United States history and Let My People Go, African-Americans, 1804 to 1860. In 2008, she published an edited, ver edited work entitled Telling Histories, Black Women in the Ivory Tower, a collection of personal narratives written by African-American women historians that chronicle the entry of Black women into the historical profession and the development of the field of Black women's history. Freedom on My Mind, a History of African Americans, a co-authored college text, is in its third edition. As a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC, and as a John Simon Guggenheim Fellow, Dr. White conducted research on her newest book, Lost in the USA, American Identity from the Promise Keepers to the Million Mom March. She holds the Carter G. Woodson Medallion and the Promise Keepers to the Million Mom March. She holds the Carter G. Woodson Medallion and the Frederick Douglass Medal for Excellence in African American History and was also awarded a doctorate in humane letters from her undergraduate alma mater, Binghamton University. From 2016 to 2021, she co-directed the Scarlet and Black Project, which investigates Na Na Native Americans and African Americans in the history of Rutgers University and is co-editor of the three-part Scarlet and Black series that explores this history. Please, I'd like to welcome Dr. Deborah Gray White. Uh, no pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, uh, uh, we're gonna do the whole sharing screen now, right? Um, yes. Yeah. 
Okay, so I'm going to be sharing this. So you can all see the PowerPoint that I've um, prepared? Yes. yes. Okay, so just let me... Um, okay, so let's just hold on a second. <laughs> no matter what you do to prepare and do everything right, for whatever reason, okay, well, here we go. So I'm going to um, be reading this. I, I want to thank you for the invitation. And I actually am really jealous that I didn't graduate from Douglas because I do not have a network like this. Uh, and so it just, it sounds like, um, sounds like I, I know some of the history of uh, Douglas while particularly in my year, I graduated in 1971 from Binghamton, from Harper College. But I have to say, uh, I wish I did, and I wish we had kept up a network that was something like this, because it just sounds wonderful. So it's Black History Month again. And once again, I'm asked the question, which comes every year, uh, why do we just have a month to study Black history? Shouldn't it be studied all year round? And you know, of course, we know that it should be studied all year round, but we have to fight for it. We had to fight for just this month because while there are just as many people who may want this to be uh, Black history to be taught all year round, there are just as many people who wonder why we have it at all. And they ask, isn't having a Black History Month reverse racism? Um, how would you like it if we had a white history month? I have had that question any number of times, sort of like asking why does why do we call a Black Lives Matter Black Lives Matter? You know, but tonight I'm going to talk about this war for Black history because, as we know from what's going on in um, the political scene today, we are in a war for Black history, and it's become very, very public. So let me just make sure I can, yeah. So from the time we set foot on this continent, there's been a concerted effort, not only to keep our history from us and the American people, but also to present our history in the most negative light, to control who writes our history, how our history gets disseminated, in fact, whether it gets disseminated at all. But today the war has become very public. In times past, the forces aligned against our history have won. They've kept our history out of the narrative of the American nation, and they have kept it, this war behind doors. Not this time. One of the reasons that the controversy over critical race theory over the African-American AP course has become so fierce, I believe, is because we're winning. We're winning. So my talk tonight is really about this war against our history, um, about how this war has been going on for centuries, how the powers that be waged the war, and how we gained on them how we made headway, and how and why I think that despite the banning of books and the restrictions about what can and cannot be taught in K-12 classrooms, that we're winning this war and that we are better positioned than ever to ensure that African-American history will not just survive, but that it will thrive. The war against our history actually began when enslavers condemned us to illiteracy. When you do our history, you see, if you do it on slavery and even the years after enslavement, you've got to go to primary sources that for the most part were not written by us. For remember the very people who we depend on to get our information about Black people in slavery are the very people who made it illegal for
for Black people to read and write. In other words, they made it so that in order to know about Black people in slavery and the years beyond enslavement, we had to consult the records that they left records where they projected onto us their feelings about us and their stereotypes about us. If you wanna know where Mammy and Sambo come from, it's from white people's need to characterize us as such. Our enforced illiteracy prevented us from leaving letters and diaries and financial ledgers and meeting records the things that we historians consult to, to find out what happened in the past, the sources that could tell us about how our people felt, we couldn't write them because they had made it so that we were literate. What, the, what our people felt about their enslavers, how they resisted, it's hard to uncover this history because the enslavers kept us from reading and writing about. If anything, you have to rely on oral histories. We have a very strong oral tradition, which is natural when you consider our enforced illiteracy. We pass down our history, our stories through the spoken word. But here's the rub. You see, enslavers cemented their supremacy over our history when they declared that our oral histories, the words and stories passed down through generations, when they declared oral history illegitimate. During the late 19th and 20th century, when the field of history as a profession was being created, the fathers of American history decided that only written records could count as legitimate sources of American history. They also declared that history had to be written by quote unquote disinterested scholars. People couldn't write, they, they felt that people couldn't write about their own group because they believed that no one could be objective about their own people. As one scholar of the process is noted in America, Professional historians were to be neutral, disinterested judges and not advocates or propagandists. History, professional historians believed, was not to be written for utilitarian purposes. And the historian's primary allegiance was not to his or her people, but to quote, objective historical truth. It's not until well into the second half of the 20th century, really just a few decades ago, that American historians began to ask whether or not true objectivity was really possible. For most of the 20th century, the profession and history departments took pride in the fact that practitioners of history studied societies with which they had no organic connection. That obviously left us out. It left out black people from writing about black people. They also declared that real history could only be written by men. Wow. Women professional historians argued were too emotional to write objectively about the past. White male scholars believed they needed to separate themselves from the home and the household, from passion and from sex in order to write objective history. Women's concerns, they said, hovered around the small things of life, but men's concerns were about real things, wars and politics and important men. Thus, they said, men had to write history. In other words, and here's the point, when history became a professional occupation, our history and our people were excluded. 
it was thought that black men and women couldn't be trusted with any kind of history, especially black history. History and the profession of history was gendered male and by, a law, and by and large, it was raced white. When the historical profession, with the historical profession set up this way, you can see that black historians, especially black female historians were in for a real battle for in very real terms, this meant that for most of the 20th century, the historical profession was dominated by white men. At its pinnacle sat a man named Ulrich B. Phillips, whose research style and method of using written records came to dominate the way that slavery was interpreted. In 1918, Phillips published American Negro Slavery. This was three years after the film Birth of a Nation swept the country with its denigrating characterization of African Americans. <laughs> Written with the required air of detachment and neutrality, this book championed an old South view of slavery that depicted idyllic, idyllic plantations where planters civilized childlike slaves, protected and nourished them, treated them kindly and provided opportunities for advancement. Sound familiar? While the 1915 film Birth of a Nation had us as monsters, in 1918, Phillips, the professional historian, characterized us as infantile, lazy, and backward. He characterized female slaves as women who were protected by their masters and overseers. Black women, he says, were wantonly sexual and unusually prolific, and it was masters who instilled proper sexual behavior. This became the accepted view of slavery for most of the 20th century. The fact that today many people want to resurrect this view of slavery is very telling. But also telling is the fact that it is based almost entirely on a view of, uh, that was drawn from white sources and from people considered white experts. They ignored the view drawn from the very few slave narratives that exist of people like Frederick Douglass and Henry Bibb, Harriet Jacobs and Sojourner Truth, the black sources. This was, the way, this was their way of winning the war against black history. On the public front, they presented us as uncivilized, or as buffoons, and on the professional front, they pre presented a view of slavery that was drawn from sources that appeared to represent truth. This truth made them feel good. But as I told you, we have been fighting this battle for a long time. In 1915, Carter G. Woodson, one of the very few Black people to earn a PhD in history, established the Association for the Study of Negro Life in History. Today, it is the Association for the Study of African American Life in History. He argued that a people needed to know their history, that the Black history that what was being taught in 1915 was, as he called it, downright propaganda and effort to praise one race and decry the other to justify social repression. In 1882, George Washington Williams wrote the first history of African-Americans, the history of the Negro race in America from 1619 to 1880. And in 1935, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote Black Reconstruction, a book that countered the negative history put forth in Birth of a Nation. 
and which is still thought by many historians to be the absolute best history of Reconstruction ever written. The most poignant histories of the race, however, came from educated Black women who felt that the Black woman's history was especially oppressive. Said club woman Sylvani Francoise Williams of Louisiana, for the Negro woman has been reserved the hardest blow, the darkest shadow, and the deepest wound. In a similar vein, Addie Hunton, the first Black graduate of Philadelphia's Spencerian College of Commerce in 1889, regretted that, quote, those who write most about the moral degradation of the Negro woman know little or nothing of the best element of our woman. Hunton alluded to the horrible aspects of the Black woman's past when she delicately noted, quote, the almost unmentionable history of the burdens of those soul trying times when to bring profit to the slave trade and to satisfy the base desires of the stronger hand, the Negro woman was the subject of compulsory immorality. In short, black women understood that they had been used and abused by enslavers to make babies for slavery and to satisfy the lust of white men. And they also knew that they were being left out of the histories written by men like Ulrich B. Phillips. They wanted to demonstrate that it was white men, not black women, who were the forces of immorality. And they wrote history after history of black women to prove the black woman's worth. And they did so by ignoring the objectivity principle which they thought was absurd. Quote, the value of any published work, especially if historical in character, must be largely inspirational. Unquote, wrote Gertrude Moselle, author of the 1908 book, The Work of the Afro-American Woman. Moselle understood history to be functional. For her, it was motivational. Race instinct and race pride were behind it. And it always had for its development a basis of self-respect. The task she set for herself in the work, the work of the Afro-American woman, was to show both the nation and black women just how far they had come since being, as she said, trammeled by their past condition. Susie King Taylor, for example, wrote her account of life behind the Union lines, quote, to accomplish some good and instruction for its readers and to plead for justice for black people because blacks had fought so hard in the Civil War and sacrificed so much for the nation. Elizabeth Lindsay Davis wrote, her history of the Illinois Federation of Women's Clubs so that the young, younger generation of black women would appreciate what had been done for them and be inspired to carry on. I could go on and on and naming the histories that these women wrote and why they wrote them. But suffice it to say that black historians and particularly black women historians dispensed with the notion that history was not to be functional. History for us has always been functional as opposed to white historians, the white historians who professionalize history. We used history to make us feel good, not to make white people feel guilty. For black women, and the many others who wrote outside of the profession, <laughs> history was not just about men. History proved the woman's worth. They were decidedly womanist. It is not surprising that so many wrote about the organization life of African-American women because they believed 
as did Josephine Salone Yates, one of the first presidents of the National Association of Colored Women, that women's organization was, quote, the first step in nation making, and that, quote, a race, a race can rise no higher than its women. In other words, the means by which one measured the progress of Black Americans was in the progress of its women. Their club histories directly challenged the idea that only men made and were the center of history. Anna J. Cooper made this point as early as 1892 when she began her treatise, A Voice from the South, with the admonition, sorry, that, quote, the busy objectivity of the more turbulent life of our men serves to cloud or color their vision somewhat. Cooper wanted everyone to know that Black history began not with the politics of great Black men, but with homes, the woman's sphere. The atmosphere of homes is no rarer and purer and sweeter than are the mothers in these homes. A race is but a total of family, she said. A nation is the aggregate of its homes. As the maker of homes, from Anna J. Cooper's point of view, it was the black woman who best represented the race and who was therefore at the center of African-American history. Throughout the 20th century, we fought to control our history. And it should come as no surprise that it was black women who were the movers and shakers behind the establishment of Black History Week, which in 1976 turned into Black History Month. While the Journal of Negro History began publishing Black History in 1915, they published very few articles written by black women. On the other hand, the Negro History Bulletin, which by 1942 was staffed and written almost entirely by women, highlighted the work of female African-Americans. It was female teachers, black teachers, and black female librarians who pushed the idea and the establishment of Negro History Week, which turned into Black History Month. Without them, without this network of teachers and librarians across the country, there would be no Negro History Week. There would be no Black History Month. Now, this was especially important in the War for Black History because the professional world of history, that which was dominated and controlled by white men, locked us out. As I noted before, one of the things they did was to virtually outlaw the use of oral history, especially the oral histories taken during the 1930s. During the 1930s depression, under the auspices of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal program, the government created projects for American citizens. Artists and writers were able to be paid by going into the homes of African-Americans and recording their memories of slavery and or um, of the Civil War and Reconstruction. Though the, his though the people who they interviewed were elderly, they told stories about their experience during this very tumultuous time in American history. There are volumes and volumes of these histories. Most, though not all, of the interviewers were white and most of the subjects were black. And here you can see some of the interviewees. The oral histories are categorized by state. 
And as I said, there are volumes and volumes of the recollections of people like these you see. The historical profession ignored these sources. Why? Because they told a different story than did so many of the white sources. Because just like today, the powers that be, be they historians, state legislatures, governors, politicians, did not want their story told. The other thing they did was to make sure that we could not publish in the established historical journals, which made it almost impossible for Black people, educated Black people, to become historians. Because we know if you don't publish, you perish. Our history could only be published in the Journal of Negro History and the Negro History Bulletin, which the profession dismissed as propaganda, not history. Between 1895 and 1980, the American Historical Review, the premier historical journal, published only one article by a black historian. That's almost a hundred years. <laughs> and that was W.E.B. Du Bois 1910 article on reconstruction. The Journal of American History founded in 1914 published only three articles on black history between 1945 and 1975. The Journal of Southern History, where we, sh I mean, we should have been all over Southern History, published only nine Black authored articles between 1955 and 1975. This denigration by exclusion is one of the reasons Black scholars shied away from writing Black history. Since white scholars believe that black scholars could not be objective about their own history, African-American historians feared further exclusion brought on by being typecast as a Negro historian who could write only Negro history. Before black historians could enter the profession of history, they had to prove their ability to be historians by first writing about whites. The profession clearly did not welcome black historians. The late Nathan Huggins, who wrote a defining book on the Harlem Renaissance, Renaissance, understood that he could not get a PhD if he wrote his dissertation about African-Americans. Instead, to ensure that he would not get locked out of the profession, he chose to research and write about poverty among Boston whites in the late 19th century. Huggins, who was my master's thesis mentor, told me that he felt comfortable writing about Blacks only after he had proven himself as a historian by writing about whites. This was the way it was when I entered the profession. We were largely locked out if we wrote about Blacks and we could not get published if we did. And a bit of personal history will give you a sense of how the war was waged on the ground and how I experienced it. I wrote the book, Aren't I a Woman? Female Slaves in the Plantation South. Today, it is regarded as a classic and a pioneering text in African-American women's history, but it barely escaped the trash heap. When I decided on my dissertation topic, I did not know that I had entered a war zone where the battle for African-American history and for women's history in particular was being raged. You see, in order to write a book about black women, I had to rely upon the black oral history sources that had for so long been deemed illegitimate reference material. Although I explained to my advisor and my reading committee that my reading of plantation records rendered enslaved women invisible, useless in a study that looked at slavery through black women's eyes. 
I was chastised for being lazy and the paucity of plantation records in my sources was offered as evidence of the fact that I was a lousy historian who was unwilling to take the time and effort it, that it took to go through plantation records and find black women's history. You're just a bad historian. I, I could go on and on about that, but I won't. In reality, I was being told that by relying so heavily on the WPA narratives, the black sources, I was taking the easy way out, that I was shrinking the hard work, the real work that was presented by the traditional white sources. The fact is I had spent over a year with plantation records and other so-called traditional sources. And it was like getting blood from a stone. I was young, I was naive. I took this criticism as a personal assault without seeing the larger political picture. Encoded in the criticism was a piercing message. Enslaved women had been invisible in the historical record. And I was being told that to make them visible, I would have to abide by the dictates of a profession that prioritized the words and feelings of those who had rendered them invisible in the first place. I was being told that enslaved women's voices as they came through the WPA narratives would not be heard unless whites approved of them. I was being told that these people did not have a history worth telling, that their version of slavery was not objective, that their memories were less sacrosanct than those of their masters and their descendants. Also, although no one really said it right out, outright to me, my objectivity was suspect because hey, I'm a black woman doing black woman's history. And underneath all of the critiques of the innumerable problems that existed with the WPA narratives, as if they're the only sources of slavery that really present problems, was the message that black people could not be trusted with their own history. The rejections to this book came fast and furious. My dissertation was rejected three weeks before I was to defend it. And it took a rewrite and another year before it was accepted. Although the dissertation passed, getting tenure was just another nightmare. The rejections kept coming fast and furious. The first chapter of the book deals with Mammy. I offered her up not as a real life person, but as a stereotype. Okay, first I sent the article, I sent it out as an article and it appears as the first chapter in the book, but uh, it kept getting sent back over and over and over again. Mammy, by this time, and this is in the late 1970s and 80s, had become such a quintessential black female stereotypes that Americans and historians would not let her go. The critiques of r and a woman were universally the same for six years. It's not complete. There's not enough work. There's no proof. And then almost universally publishers added there's no audience for this book. What did they mean? This is how publishers got in on the game of rejecting black history. Did they mean that nobody wants this in the historical records? Black women's history is not interesting enough for people to pay for it. Black women, black people don't read. Black people's memories, our testimonies don't matter. We are not important historical actors. Is that what they meant? To make a long story short, I was up against the tenure wall. And then 
everything changed just like that. The details are important, but I won't, I don't have time to go into them now. But months before my tenure clock was up, I got a letter from the late Ann Fair Scott, a white female historian who is today recognized as a founder of women's history. She said it was the best thing that she had read on black women in slavery. She offered to present the manuscript to W.W. W. Norton, a Fifth Avenue publishing house. And the rest is, as we shall, as we say, it was is history. To say that I won a battle in the fight for African-American history is an understatement. Our opponents had been so effective that they had kept enslaved Black women out of the most basic research tool in the library, the card catalog. For when Arn I, a woman, female slaves in the plantation South, got to the Library of Congress, they didn't know what to do with it. It had no place to go. An editorial meeting had to be held to determine what to do with this unusual book. As reported by Sheridan Henry, the editorial director at the Library of Congress on February 13th, 1985, it was proposed that the heading Women Slaves be established by the Library of Congress. The heading was approved by the subject editorial meeting on March 5th, 1985, and books about female slaves were recataloged under the new heading. Today, oral histories have made it possible to write more histories like Arnai. Though some still find these kinds of sources questionable, most historians understand the gross inequities and danger of ignoring oral histories. This was a big history. This was a big victory in the war for African-American history. History is not made by great men or great women for that matter. It's not just about wars or even federal, state or local politics, nor is it just about natural or man-made disasters, ordinary history. Ordinary people make history, oral histories, make it possible for us to study the history ordinary people make, especially Black people. Let me conclude with another story that explains why I titled this talk, Not This Time. A few decades ago, I was in Texas at a meeting of the Texas State Social Studies Board. Along with my co-author, William Deverell and the vice President for Social Studies Publishing of Silver Bird Ed. And again, well, we had a textbook that we, is a fifth grade textbook that we wanted to prove so that it could be sold in the state of Texas. We started our textbook differently than those that had been previously published and also some that were also up for approval. Instead of having Europeans discover America, as if there was no one here. We began our fifth grade textbook with the idea that three cultures met in North America, Native Americans, Europeans, and Africans. We talked about how there were many places in America where Africans were actually in the majority. And we talked about how these cultures blended, what each group contributed to the American nation and of course, how over time racial slavery was born. I had heard that as far as textbooks were concerned, as Texas goes, so goes the nation. But as a relatively young, naive historian, I thought that, of course, this history is so self-evident that no one will reject this. Well, Texas did. And I got a firsthand up close lesson in politics, Texas style, when I sat before the Social Studies Board of Texas. 
my co-author and I endured relentless questioning about why we began the book the way we did, why we spent so much time on the discrimination of African-Americans, and even why we even mentioned the Holocaust in discussing World War II. With the exception of representatives from Houston, Dallas, and Austin, all of whom were Black women, who thought that the book hit just the right tone and was appropriate for fifth graders. Okay, we had written it in college language, um, but we had the we had uh, fifth grade book writers and storytellers translate it for ten year olds. The rest of the board told us that fifth graders were not ready for this kind of story. This is behind closed doors in Texas. Fifth graders the board said, did not need books that would make them feel bad. This was in the 1990s, almost 30 years ago. Let that sink in for a minute. Behind closed doors, they put a stop to the kind of history that was now being explored in universities and schools across the world. Needless to say, our book, was not adopted by Texas or in any of the other states that had similar social studies boards. But something has changed. Something is very different now. The governors of Florida and Texas, Governor DeSantis and Greg Abbott have been very public in their resistance to black history. But those of us on the other side have more than turned the corner, which makes me believe that the reason that they are so strident, so belligerent in their fight is because they're losing. There's an organization of over 20 universities that is studying their universities role in the institution of slavery. The, U, um, the, the University of North Carolina, the University of North Carolina Press has a new series on black women, um, a publishing uh, a series. And that's just a tiny bit of the evidence that black history is here to say. And just recently, Macmillan Publishing Company decided to go forward with Freedom on My Mind, a textbook that I co-authored as their textbook on advanced placement history. This despite the opposition to the course by the governors of Florida and Texas. Hey, as Quincy Jones said about rap music, black history, black history is here to stay. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. <laughs> wow. That was uh eye-opening wow. to say the least. <laughs> wow. Thank um, you very much. We are going to have a brief question and answer period. Um yes, we will open up for questions. Um, if you have questions, you can drop them in the chat, comments, drop them in the chat or you're free to use the raise hand um, feature and we'll call on you. There's a question from Janae uh, saying, how is our use history? Are you all, um, I'm tr oh, uh, should I stop sharing my screen? Yes, you could stop sharing your screen. And okay, then there, now I can get back to, to everybody. Okay.
I don't have a question per se. You have a couple of hands up, I see. Who is um, coordinating the questions? Karen Lynch, I see oh. your hand raised. Yeah, hi, thank you. That was fascinating. And uh, thank you for being here tonight. Really appreciate it. I was wondering when you had to do your rewrite and wait another year, did you have to alter the way you told the story in a way that was not satisfying to you? To be honest, um, and you know, I've had to struggle with this a long time. It got better. No, it was, um, uh, I, I fault the person who held it up for the way that they told me and for not reading it when it was first sent to, to him. But to be honest, what happened was one of the other members of my committee said to me at the time, and you know, it, it, so much time has passed, but there was absolutely very little that had been written on African-American women. And, and actually there was very little that had been written on the history of women, period. And what um, one of the, my committee members said was, why don't you check out anthropologists and the, anthropolo the anthropologists really know they're, they're looking at gender in a way that historians are not yet looking at. So I went and just de delved into the um, uh, to to anthropological literature, and when I came back up, I had a totally different interpretation. So on the one hand, I mean, yeah, it was a it was a terrible experience as anyone who has, you know, who has gone up against and tried to, to get a PhD, et cetera. Awful. And and actually it it now it has influenced the way that I mentor. Because I would never sit before a young graduate student and just tell them point blank, you're lazy and you just don't, you haven't done any work. You know, I would coach them. I, you know, you, you could, you, you just, you, 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 you mold them and, and help them. Um, but yeah, it, it got better. And then before I actually um, published it, uh, I did at least three or four more rewrites before it became a book. And each time it got better. Thank you. Question from Jean. Yeah, hi, thank you. That, that was wonderful. You always teach us so much and I'm grateful to you for that. So a um, couple of us on, on this call are trustees at Rutgers and a lot of us are involved with the university. Uh, so obviously what happened with Paul Robeson uh, where he was like, thrown aside until I guess the, uh, the 80s or the 90s uh, and Will's Way at Old Queens where he was a slave who did a lot of the building of old queens. I mean, we've done a lot of stuff recently. How do you think Rutgers has come about dealing with the African-American black experience over the decades and how are we doing now? Um, well, <laughs> that's a loaded question. I'm not sure I can answer it. Um, you got freedom of speech here. It's an academic community. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, you, you are. Yeah, and some people leave their lose their jobs over uh, that kind of um, you know thinking. Um, I think Rutgers is, has has as most universities have really. I mean, as a historian, I mean, I look at this as a personal person as a personal um, journey as well as uh, I look at it as a historian. And if you look at universities before the late 1960s, there was a color line that was drawn. And so, so very few um, African-Americans were able to go to school. And so I think that when Rutgers says that it's Newark campus in particular is the most diverse public university in the country, they're right. And there's a, there's, they should, um, and we should celebrate that. Um, my my problem, of course, is that the pullback on affirmative action, I think, is really going to be disastrous in some effect, in some ways. Um, but I, I do think that more can be done 
uh, and it doesn't have to be that way if we make uh, inroads into dealing with some of the class issues that keep not just um, African Americans and other minorities back, but from, you know, but but as white whites as well. So I I like to say that, you know, this is a long distance run. It's a long distance run, and so it's not a sprint. But in comparison, you know, I, I'd like to see us moving forward. But we seem to be taking two steps forward and one step back all the time. Um, as far as Rutgers is concerned, I think the um, we have to see. It's not enough to just have an African-American president. Next question is in the chat from Bernice Venable. This question and comment. So, so please, you mentioned Texas. It still leaves the pack and is detrimental to the progress in our public schools when it comes to book selection. It is based on economics, unfortunately. Are there efforts to offset that influence? Oh, yeah. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Because Texas, no, you know, Texas, I mean, Texas is a big state. I mean, Try driving across it or even, you know, whichever, whether you go east or west or north or south, it is huge. And, and, but, but, but technology has changed Texas's influence so that um, now that you have, uh, now that pub publishing books are digitized, mm -hmm. you can take a textbook and you can digitize it and such so, so that Texas can have the same textbook as, say, California. But you can, you know, you can take a textbook. You don't have to reprint everything over and over again. You can change it very easily and very quickly um, through the way that, uh, by, by just digitizing things. So you can have a, the textbook. So for example, um, the, the textbook, uh, uh, the, the fifth grade textbook that we wrote now, mm -hmm. although it, this is really dated now and we haven't updated it, but you can take that textbook and change parts of it so that Indiana can have the same textbook, but it can be geared towards Indiana without having to republish the whole thing. And so it is technology that's really changed uh, so much. The, the politics is, you know, what goes on in state legislatures. I mean, the problem is that it's going to take maybe a generation mm -hmm. before some of these uh, young people who will graduate from, from, the, some, from some of the schools in Florida and Texas and other states like that, before they realize that they are up against not just a, they're up against other students who are learning so much more and who are going to be so much better prepared to deal with international and national issues. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's a shame, but that's, that's what's going to happen. I mean, sorry, but um, the, the um, even in the, even in New York, where I came from the New York state regents test and even the advanced placement, is being um, outdone or uh, outdistanced by the international baccalaureate degree. And so the kids around the world are learning so much more and, and they're, they're moving so quickly. And you know, so you're gonna say, well, you can't read this and you can't read this. And then how do you equip young students um, for the 21st century? I, it's going to happen that we're going to wake up and say, oh, my goodness. And and that's in STEM as well as in the humanities. Yes. We have another question from Judy Musa. Um, how would you suggest we as citizens help tell the truth even here where there are school boards that follow Texas and Florida's policies? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, uh, I don't mean to suggest that it's just uh, Texas and Florida because um, I work with the um, uh, the NEH the, uh, the, and I do teacher workshops mm -hmm. in the summertime. And so I know that even like in New Jersey, 
uh, which is not governed by a state board, but where um, individual school boards have uh, control. And I do understand that that's a problem. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think that each, each, each district is going to have to come up with its own strategy. But let me tell you, I, it's teachers getting around it. I, I, I work with teachers uh, and I worked uh, this summer. I taught, um, I just taught one class. I have directed some of these projects in the summertime and you would, it's really interesting in the way that teachers will design their lesson plans so that they can teach the uh, the subject matter that they want to teach without violating whatever rules they suppose that they, mm -hmm. and it's a shame because they, you see them sitting there and saying, well, okay, now how can, my school district won't let me do this. So how do you suppose, and they divide, and they do that during these summer programs where, uh, you know, they, they, they devise ways of doing it. Um, I think that you have to look at the the you have to look at the the long picture. I'm a mm -hmm. historian, so maybe I'm a little bit more uh, used to not, you know. I wish uh, I'm trying to live more in the moment, but you know, sometimes you have to look take the long view, and my long view is that it this this is this is a this is a particular moment, and it will pass. Uh, it may take some time. And it may take an awful long time to deal with the impact of what can and is being done. Mm -hmm. But I do believe it's going to pass. Next question from Valerie is, how do you personally deal slash cope with what you know about African-American history and what you see and personally experience as a Black woman? It sickens me hearing information you share tonight. Yeah. Um, it's hard. I, I have a therapist. <laughs> um, there, yeah. was, there was a time um when I, I'm not I, and you notice I, I'm not really laughing because it is really hard to live as mm -hmm. an African American woman. And so you're living it. You're researching it, you're writing it, you're teaching it, and it can be it can be overwhelming. Yeah. Okay. One of the things that I um I don't do I don't in in my in my entertainment I do not watch films about black people. I do sci-fi. I do um. You know anything but I do murder mysteries, etc. But it is just, it is just, I can't, uh, I, I had to just watch, I watched just recently The Color Purple because I am teaching um, a class at my church. I don't know how many, if any of you are watching oh, yeah. uh, at, at First Baptist, I'm going to be teaching a, a course entitled The Color Purple. And so I had to watch it, but I don't, I, I can't, I can't look at like uh people ask me did you see the rustin film like no i know about you yeah, know i know that i don't need to need it's see not it. entertainment <laughs> it's work um mm -hmm. and the other thing i will say is that i think that um uh, the way that i have been able to um survive is by having a friendship network totally outside of academe mm. Mm. I noticed that uh, Betty Long was uh, one of the um, when she was she was a participant this evening, and I just want to shout her out because we used to play tennis a long time ago, and boy, do I miss those days. <laughs> I have another question, and Marie, was there a formative experience? Was there a formative experience in your life that drew you to history and from which you have drawn strength to surpass the barriers you face time and time again? Well, the two most important, um, you know, I had a high school teacher and this is a high school teacher, Ms. Rothman. 
And I went to school in New York City. I, I, I'm born bred in Midtown Manhattan. Went to Julia Richmond High School and one of my teachers, uh, she realized that I really did like American history. And she gave me, um, you know, I, I would just devour the textbook, which was, and she just, she just fed me books that were from her personal collection. And, you know, and it was on, it was on the Civil War and Reconstruction. And they were books that showed me that history was not just a, it's not a, just a series of dates, you know, and, and great white men. And this was uh, the books that she gave me um, just opened my eyes. I mean, she let me read, she, I borrowed them. So she was truly inspirational. I wanted to be a high school teacher. And when I got out of college, there were no jobs. So I started teaching fifth grade, but I immediately went to, um, went back into, uh, to, 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 to graduate school. And then I will say that the experience of getting my PhD with the, um, the professor who rejected my dissertation, uh, and you know, and you look back, it was a terrible, terrible, experience but when you look back on it you realize um you know uh that sometimes god closes one door and opens another and in that case he taught me through this very negative experience what not to do how to mentor people how to talk to people um and and i have taken my role as a historian <laughs> from, you know, from him, you know, and, and when, when people, you know, other people will say, well, you know, so-and-so, this other professor said, you know, I can't do this and this is not gonna, and I was like, yes, you can, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. So um, I took a negative, you know, experience and turned it into something that became very positive for me. Yes. Okay, we got just a couple more questions. I see Dr. Inez Durham, you have your hand raised, and then Ms. Linda. You're you're muted. You're muted. Thank you so very much, Dr. White. I hope you remember that we used to ski together. <laughs> oh yeah! Oh yes! Okay. And that's that's yeah. another thing. Every you know you 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 basically have to have a total life outside <laughs> academia. And one of the things besides playing tennis, it was skiing. Tennis and skiing, and now pickleball. Um, and now I also pickleball. play pickleball. Yeah, we're doing that. yeah, I'm from <laughs> Plainfield, and. Uh, I happen to serve on the board of trustees of the local library. And we pushed to establish a policy for the library that no books will be banned. So talking about what each of us could do, uh, there are many things we could do. Uh, we need to go to those, those board of education meetings and stand Thank up you. and talk. <laughs> Places even like the library, people could come in and give their opinions about things. So uh, I just ask that we all look at ourselves and our lives and think about ways that we could participate in this fight. And just the final thing I have to say to Dr. White, for me, you are the epitome of still I rise. Keep on. Thank you. That's right. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, I do believe that um, everyone should get involved. The, you know, uh, politics is local. Mm -hmm. Politics is local. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that um, so many um, conservatives have been able to take over and to, to wage this fight is by understanding that they go to the um, to school boards and, and control these school boards. So that's one of the things we need to do. And when I say that school teachers, because up until, well, even now, I mean, um, our schools, the school system in this country are incredibly segregated still, yeah. still. And particularly the public schools, right? Because so many uh, and people, even blacks and whites, 
who can afford to send their kids to private schools do that. All right. So, but the the public school is still a, a resource. And if we could control these public schools, we can control the information that our children are getting. And so I really think it's really important. All politics is local. So you get, you know, um, understand that. And, and I think that's a really good point. And I also want to underscore the point about librarians and, and black teachers, because this, the school system was totally segregated in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. And it's, it was librarians and teachers who pushed the 1976, um, uh, or actually it started, the Negro History Week started in 1926, and it was started by the um, Association uh, of uh, the, 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 the organization that Carter G. Woodson established. But, you know, he had no way of disseminating or making sure that it happened. So it was the teachers and the librarians who, got books together and, and pushed the idea of Negro History Week. And it became so important in black schools that it by um, in the 1950s and, and, and 60s, it was became a nationwide project. And so it's, and particularly because it's black librarians who collected all of these, uh, the sources and books that um, made black history come alive for so many young black kids. And we have to remember that history. Linda Rivers, you have your hand raised. Right. Uh, first, just to say thank you so much for a very, very informative evening. I'm so glad I was able to attend. Um, my question is, how do you see the landscape for women, particularly in academia and, his, and as historians such as yourself, yourself? especially after the death of um, Antoinette Canada Bailey, um, whose dissertation actually focused on the hardship of black women face, you know, in academia, what they're facing in academia. Yeah, that is particularly heartbreaking story. And that's not the very <clears throat> first incident of suspected suicide or death. Um, you know, I, I don't know what to how to answer that. All I do know is that in the in the historical profession, black women are really thriving. When I when I mentioned the um, the new series at the University of North Carolina Press, uh, the history of black women is like really one. It was we were so excluded for so long that um, now they can't get enough of us. And so, um, and and at Rutgers, I don't know. If I, I I just would like to tout the fact that um, at in at Rutgers, Rutgers is number one in the country in African American history. We have the number one department. And when I say that, uh, this is like uh, Harvard and Princeton, all of these places. They you know they got Skip Gates. They have all of these centers, et cetera. But our department at Rutgers, New Brunswick is still number one, and we have been number one. And guess what? The vast majority, well, I think almost all of us who are doing this history and who are running that department or the Department of African American History or the whatever, uh, we are, um, we're all women. Yes. So I think that that, but I will say, um, and it's not just in, it's not just in academia. Mm -hmm. I just think, you know, we have a saying in black life, black don't crack. <laughs> I don't say that no. because we break. Black don't crack. No, we just break. And when you look at what the CDC says about African-American women and weathering, it is in just every, across the board, um, our health issues, our mental health issues are more severe than, than any other group of women in the entire country. 
So it's not just in academe. Thank you. Our last question for the evening um, is from Deborah Hipkins. Do you find charter schools or other independent schools have more success in teaching a more realistic curriculum? I mean, I, <laughs> I have grandkids that are now in um, char charter schools. I my, uh, so I don't really know because I'm not really, um, I'm, I'm not in that age group where I have kids that, and I'm not directly involved. Here's what I know. Um, my daughter homeschooled her children. I thought it was the craziest thing in the world. What do you, what do you mean you're home, going to homeschool your kids? I'm going to just say that was the smartest thing she could have ever done. I've never seen, I mean, because in, in the case of the public schools, so many of the public schools that our children go to are underfunded. Per, per capita, they just don't have what other schools have. Um, so if it, it is the case that, you know, if, if, you, if you can afford to send your kid, I, my feeling is that, you know, you just don't want your kid to be the, the, the one that's experimented on. Or, you know, we can't, they only get one chance. And so you just can't, or you often can't take a risk. If you can afford to send your kid, if you're, if the charter school, some charter schools are good, some are not. You know, I think um, every parent has to do the, the, the hard research and do whatever they can to send their kid to get the best education they can. They only go through third grade once. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you all for your uh, boy in-depth questions. Um, just as an illustration uh, to your point, Dr. Gray White, that um, about the uh, publishing, I, one of my favorite authors is uh, Zora, Neale, Zora Neale Hurston, and her Barracoon was <laughs> written in the late twenties, eight nineteen twenties, and wasn't published until twenty eighteen. So. You know, yeah. Why did that take so long? That's a whole. That's another. Maybe you can come back and tell us about about that in another day. <laughs> um, and we uh, here at AADC and Ban are here to support you. We thank you so much for your wonderful uh, presentation this evening. Um, but we are here. You can consider yourself part of our community. Uh -uh. We are here to support. We are uh, well. We welcome you with open arms. Anytime you are willing and able to come and uh, be with us for any uh, on or off the uh, the Zoom. <laughs> so, um, and uh, I don't want anybody to go away. Don't go away yet. We have um, we we just want to give a, another real um, word of thanks uh, to Dr. Deborah Gray White for her enlightening presentation. Not this time. The War for African American History, and um, tell somebody about it. Mm -hmm. um, your presence has really made this event truly impactful. Thank you all for coming. Let's continue to honor and elevate the legacy of African American history and of women's history. We invite all participants to leave a brief comment or a single word in the chat to describe your thoughts about the program, and we may use them for marketing purposes, if that's okay with you. Uh, Bertha Aiken is going to share some information about the upcoming events that AADC has planned and some that are uh, also for, for our affinity groups, including BAN. Thank you for that awesome and informative presentation, Dr. White. Looking forward to reading your books. <laughs> okay. Fellowship. There's money for graduate school. So if you're interested, please look at the website and apply for the fellowship. In terms of alumni, the fellowship deadline is March 1st. And for DRC seniors, it's June the 3rd.
Okay, we're also having upcoming Smart Talk on February 28th with Tanisha Coleman, Empowering versus Overpowering the Workplace. On March 16th, we have the Victoria Dabrowski Schmidt Workplace um, Professional and Development Committee. Interested? If you're interested in joining, contact Lori. On March 21st, we'll have a virtual Sigorian lecture at 7 p.m. And on April 15th, the Black Alumni Network will have a virtual general body meeting. All this information you can get on the website. Um, also, if Lizette, can you put in the link to the chat so that once they sign off the Zoom, they could click, if they click on the link before the Zoom ends, they can go right to it after and register for the upcoming programs. There's also time um, to still join the committee to serve on the Jewel Plummer Cobb Sisters Conference Committee. Um, the next meeting is February 12th. We just started planning and saved the date for the conference on October 26th. Okay. Did you put it in the chat? Did you put the link in the chat? Yes. The link's in the chat. Um, I, for those who don't see it, it's douglasalumnae.org. That's A L U M N A E. Um, we are not alumni, we are alumnae. <laughs> <laughs> and please continue to support the AADC in their annual appeal. Indeed. Okay. Thank you for coming. All right. Thank you all, and thank you for to our um, illustrious uh, um, office there, the AADC office. Thank you for all your help and for um, helping us get through this evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you okay. once Bye. again. Thank you, Doctor White. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thank you.